Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. Join us Sunday mornings at 11 in Sterling, Virginia. From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. I'm Ken Miller. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the missions outreach, the Bible college, and various coming events. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. Hi, this is Ken from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. I want to personally invite you to come to our church this Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. We're at 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150, in the countryside area of Sterling. Every Sunday at Abiding Life, there's a great environment of joy and love, uplifting music, an encouraging message, and free coffee and snacks. Maybe you've been looking for a church, or maybe not, but either way, we really want to see you at Abiding Life this Sunday. So come and explore grace and faith and meet some great people in the process. I cannot wait to see you at Abiding Life this Sunday. Praise the Lord. <laughs> like I said, I, I think I've gained a, a greater appreciation for that song in preparing for today's sermon because I used to think, well, that's fine if I were Jew, but I'm not a Jew. Abraham's not my father, right? God's my father. But Paul said, and we're going to see it in, in Romans 4, that Abraham is the father of all of us. And I'm going to share with you what I believe he meant by that. By the way, this marks our anniversary at this location. Uh, we started at this location the second Sunday in 2017. So this is exactly two years at this location. Let's begin in Romans chapter 4, the first three verses. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Heavenly Father, I just submit the service and this sermon into your hands. I ask you, Lord, to speak through me. Let me speak nothing of fleshly origin, but let me speak that which the Spirit has prompted me to speak. Bring things to my remembrance that you would like for me to share with your people. And I just ask, Lord, that this be good seed planted on good soil and that it produce an abundant harvest for your glory and for your honor in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've been going through, when, when I've been doing the sermon, I've been working my way through the book of Romans. We're only in chapter 4, but we're going to get all the way through the uh, chapter 4 today. Just briefly, if you, if you look through Romans, especially chapter 2, but I would say the last few verses of chapter 1 and at least the first half of chapter 3, you might get the impression, well, Paul's just preaching against sin, but that's really not his point. His point is that we're all guilty. We're all in the same boat. Even, even if he, he was speaking primarily to the Jewish Christians in, in Rome, and he's saying that, yes, you're aware of all these sins that the, that the people are committing, the people of the world or the, the, the heathen or the Gentiles, all these sins that they commit, but you're just as guilty. Maybe you're not guilty of the exact same things, but you're guilty of many things. And so he went through all that in chapter two and he continued it in chapter three. Chapter three, he's really getting to the point that we're all in the same boat, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what your heritage is, we're all in the same boat. We're lost without Jesus. We're lost without a savior. And just, just adding Jesus to your life isn't what it's all about. Just saying, you know, maintaining all the Jewish tradition, but Jen, adding Jesus to, to all the other tradition is not what it's about. Okay, Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Covenant. Okay, so this is, this is what, what, I've, what I'm seeing in especially these first three chapters that we've come through is that wrong doctrine produces wrong believing and wrong believing produces wrong living. We need to get our, our believing right and as if you believe right, you'll live right. You know, a lot of it has to do with what you believe. And two weeks ago when we had our Grace Conference, one thing that Connie kept emphasizing especially in her messages, is identity. And he, 
indicating that the biggest problem that we have as Christians or many people, the, one of the biggest problems we have is identity. We don't see who we really are in Christ. We don't truly identify this, the fact that he says, as he is, so are we in this world. If we really see ourselves the way God sees us, he gives us the gift of righteousness. If, he, if we saw ourselves the way God sees us, as he is, so are we in this world. If we really saw ourselves the way he sees us, we would probably, I won't even say probably, we would live much, victorious, much more victorious lives, I believe, if we really saw ourselves the way God sees us. Someone asked me recently, the way you preach grace, what's to stop you from sinning? Why don't, you know, what's to stop a Christian since we're not under law, but we're under grace? And, God, and I, I've stated, and I believe this is true, that God has forgiven you of not only your past sins, but he's already forgiven you of your future sins. So someone asked me, well, what's to stop you from sinning all you want to? My response to that is, I do. <laughs> I do sin all I want to. I just don't want to. You know what I mean? What happens is when you're, when you're truly in a relationship with Jesus, your want to changes. He changes your want to. Okay, so I do what I want to do, which is I want to serve Jesus. Under grace, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, working something on the inside of you to change that want to. <laughs> he's changing your nature. He's changing your behavior. He's working from the inside out. And I'm going to come back to this, but uh, I, I was thinking as I was meditating on this, there's a scripture that says exactly this. And that is Philippians chapter 2. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Chapter 2, where for, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And I, and I, I like this so much, I looked it up in some other translations, because <laughs> I don't have to try to improve my behavior. Now, don't take that and run the wrong direction with it, but it's God working in me to do that. It's not a struggle. To, one person told me, it's so hard to live a Christian life. Well, it's hard to live a Christian life if you're trying to live it with your own effort. But it's God working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. The tree of life, this uh, second one is the tree of life Bible. It says, for, it's, for God is at work within you, helping you to want to. So there, there, it, that deals with the want to, helping you to want to. So sin all you want to, well... I don't want to. <laughs> it's God working in you, helping you to want to obey him, and then helping you to do what he wants. The uh, Common English Bible, that's the next one, yes, C-E-B, the Common English Bible, God is the one who enables you both to want and to actually live out his good purposes. God's Word translation says, it is God who produces in you the desires and actions that please him. Amen. Isn't that so true? I mean, when you're serving Jesus, it's not like you have to give up anything. He just changes you on the inside so you begin to want the things that please him. Amen. For God is working in you. And I think that's one reason why people are reluctant be to, to become Christians. Perhaps that's the way we presented it in the past. You got to give up that. You've got to give up that. Stop doing this. You know, don't you know that's a sin? So if we come against, if we come across that way, sure, they're, they're not going to be attracted to it. But if we really understand that it's God working in you, let's see this, this last one, the New Living Translation. God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. To me, this is, this is really the heart of the gospel. That God is doing the work. You don't have to sweat it. You don't have to. It's just not a big deal because he is the one doing the work. The Holy Spirit. See, I see the new birth as a literal thing. It's not just a, like we talk about being justified. Go on to that next screen. We're going to repeat this. And one thing I want to emphasize is that word justified. I know I talked about that when we were doing chapter three, but there's so much more in this word justified. When you're born again, it's a literal regeneration of your heart, a re regeneration of your spirit. You are a brand new person, completely. Now, the soul, you know, the mind still needs to be renewed and that type of thing, but you are a brand new person on the inside. It's a literal regeneration. And so these want-tos begin to change. You know, we, 
we we talked about chapter three with all the rhetorical questions. There were 17 rhetorical questions, and he continues in chapter four and then chapter five and chapter six. He continues to get give rhetorical questions. He, it seems like he asks a question, and then he answers the question with another question. And he, he continues to teach in this fashion. But this whole chapter is really about Abraham. I mean, it's about grace and faith, but it's using Abraham as the as the prime example of what justification really is. And just to be justified, this isn't just a legal term. And it's, it is a legal term, but it's not just a legal term. And it's not just a religious word. It's a literal thing. It's, it's something that really takes place. It's true regeneration. It's a complete restoration back to what God originally intended, back to God's original intent. And I'm going to take it a step further. I would say anything that's contrary to God's perfect will for your life is unjust. Hear what I'm saying. Anything that's not in God's perfect will and his desire for you is not just. It's unjust. So I would say sin is unjust. So what God, the way God deals with that is he imputes into the gift of righteousness, making you just, making you justified. And anything else that's contrary to God's perfect will, I would say sickness is unjust. So God imputes health into you, making you healthy, justified. And we, you know, we say, and I, I've quoted it already this morning, and you know the scripture, I believe in 1 John 4, 17, that as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we. And this is true. It's absolutely true, but is it fully manifesting? As he is, so am I in this world. So what is just when it comes to that? What is just is that we would manifest as he is, so are we in this world. So Anything in your life that doesn't look like God is unjust. I hope you follow what I'm saying. Anything in your life that doesn't look like Jesus is unjust. Because as he is, so are you in this world. So if, if, you're, if you're living the, your Christian life and you're still dealing with, wh whether it's a spiritual thing like sinful habits or whether it's a physical thing like a health issue or or a, a relationship issue, if you're dealing with things in your life that don't look like Jesus, <laughs> I think it's, it's right that you can believe that God is taking care of it. God is dealing with it. It's right to believe that God will end your sin. It's right to believe that God will end your bitterness, or whatever it is, whatever the issue is. It's right to believe that, in other words, I'm saying it's not your issue. It's Turn it over to God. He says, cast all your cares upon him and he will take care of you. It's right to believe that God will end your jealousy. It's right to believe that God, you know, this is what he's promised to do. It's right to believe that God will take care of your bad behavior. In other words, it's not a struggle that we should have to fight. If we turn it over to him and we know that he's already changed us on the inside and he is in us causing us to will or want to do his will, and it's him in us that's causing that good behavior to actually begin to manifest. Do you follow what I'm saying? <laughs> it's right to believe that God will end your hatred. Whatever issue it is, it's, it, it's right to believe that God will end your addictions. It's right to believe that God will end your unforgiveness. I mean, all of us are dealing with something probably. And all of us are dealing with something different. But whatever the issue is, it's right to believe that God's got it in the palm of his hand and he is dealing with it. So, you know, Andrew Walmack has that book, Effortless Change. And I believe that that's the way true Christianity should be. Effortless change. Because the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you doing the work. It's not ours to do, it's his doing. God will end your stinginess. God will end your sin. God, it's right to believe that God will also take care of all your physical issues, all your mental issues, all your financial problems. That's what God has promised to do. God has promised to impart his very life into you. Somehow, I believe Abraham got this. I don't know really how, but somehow Abraham got this. And, you know, it says, Abraham... If Abraham were justified by works, he'd have something to glory. Some translations say he'd have something to boast about. If I could make myself right through my own effort, I'd have something to boast about, right? 
but not before God. He doesn't want it to be about your behavior, and you shouldn't want it to be about, about your self-effort. It's about God, God in you, the Holy Spirit in you, him doing the work. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to, unto him for righteousness. So how did Abraham become righteous? He believed. He believed upon the justifier. Let's go on to verse 4. Now unto him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. If you have to work, if, you have, if, if it's up to you to do certain things to win God's favor, that's not grace, right? Grace is unmerited favor. So, but, so to him that worketh, it's not to him that worketh, but him that believeth. It's by faith. By grace through faith. Anything you receive from God is by grace through faith. Somehow Abraham got this. Somehow he believed it. Abraham, you know, God explained it to him. Verse 5 is a good verse to quote to, to the devil or anyone that tries to sell, tell you something contrary to this or bring an accusation against you that it's not to him that works, it's but him that believeth. Faith is counted for righteousness. So I can say I'm righteous. I don't know. I don't care what sin I might have committed recently or what sin I might commit tomorrow. I'm not planning on any. Don't worry about that. But <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I were to stumble, I can still say I'm righteous. So can you. Because it's not something you earn. It's a gift. And that's when someone told me, well, what's to stop someone from sinning all you want to? Well, I don't want to. You know, it's, it's the heart that changes. The new birth is a literal thing. It's, it's natural to expect a sinner to sin, right? If someone does not have a relationship with Jesus, they're going to act like they don't have a relationship with Jesus. A sinner is going to sin. It's their nature. <laughs> but now that you're born again, it's your nature to do righteous, to do righteously. Amen? So somehow Abraham got this revelation, but not only Abraham, David got it also. David is another man who understood the grace of God through faith. Let's go on to verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, blessed, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So this is a quote from Psalm 32 that Paul is reminding his readers of. And it would make no sense if salvation were by works. But this is why David was called a man after God's own heart. He understood faith and he understood grace. So if Israel's greatest forefather, Abraham, and their greatest king, David, were justified by grace through faith, we must know that this has always been God's plan. It's his plan for all generations. It's this is, know that this is God's plan for every person in every generation. Not salvation by works, not salvation by do's and don'ts, not salvation by rituals and ceremonies and even church attendance. Those things do not win you favor with God. It's grace through faith. Grace through faith. So, and notice in verse 8, it doesn't say, it didn't say the Lord did not or the Lord does not, but the Lord will not impute sin. If you're in Jesus, if you've received the gift of righteousness, he will not impute sin. Praise God. That's a, a good shouting moment there. All right, let's go on to verse 9. <laughs> cometh, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So we look at this from a new covenant perspective and we say, of course, right? Of course, circumcision has nothing to do with it. I mean, that almost seems pointless to even mention. But back then in that first century church, this was very, it was incredibly controversial in first century Christianity. In our day, there may be other issues like people might put their faith in their church attendance or their 
obeying certain rituals and rules, but you know, circumcision isn't, isn't a main issue for us. But Paul's main point here was that Abraham was declared righteous 14 years before he became circumcised. He, he was made righteous. He was declared righteous 14 years approximately before he was circumcised. So his point is circumcision had nothing to do with it. And he was declared righteous. But what I want you to see, it gets real exciting, I think, in my mind, <laughs> in verse 11, because I, I, began, I began to understand that I am a child of Abraham. So this song, Father Abraham, has new meaning to me. It's not just a fun children's song, even though it is that. <laughs> I am one of them, and so are you. <laughs> So let's all praise the Lord. All right, so let's, let's go on to verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. How many of you believe this morning? So this is saying Abraham is your spiritual father. What does that mean? Well, I'll try to explain it in just a minute, but let me, let me start over again. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that that righteousness might be imputed to them also. That, that means us also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So verse 11 reveals that Abraham is the father of all who believe, not just the Jews, not just the circumcised. See, we don't have to be a Jew. We don't have to be a literal physical descendant of Abraham, and we can call ourselves children of Abraham. And what this means is that you have full rights to all the promises of Abraham. You have full access to all the blessings of Abraham. And so, so as a child of Abraham, as a, as, as a descendant, spiritually speaking, descendant of Abraham, you have access to all those blessings. And we talked about this a little bit. Paul introduced this topic to some degree in chapter two. And let me remind you what he said in chapter two, chapter two, verse 28 and 29. He said, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not of the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. All right. So this is telling you, and we talked about this, Paul, Paul mentions this in chapter two. He's kind of hinting to this again in chapter four. He'll go into a lot more detail when we get into chapter nine, but he's saying that, that you are the true Jews. You are the true Israel of God. If your faith is in Jesus as your savior. So Paul, Paul, again, he emphasizes this in more in chapter nine. He touches on it in Galatians chapter three, which we're going to look at in a minute. The true Israel of God includes no more than and no less than all who place their faith in Jesus Christ. So the, the Bible talks about the seed of Abraham. Who is the seed of Abraham? Well, let's go on to, to verse 13 of Romans 4. For the, the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham and to his, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are uh, of the law be heirs, faith is made void. So he's saying specifically, it's not those who are descendants of Abraham through the law, but are the heirs, but it's faith. If they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise is made of no, none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, is no transgression. Now there's a lot that can be said about this. Uh, the, there's a lot more in this than what I'm going to say. But who is the seed of Abraham? It says, that the promise is to Abraham and his seed through faith. Now, some people will say, well, the seed of Abraham was Isaac, right? No. <laughs> Other people will say, well, it's all the, all the Israelites, all the Jews, or all the Israelites, which aren't necessarily the same thing. But no, that's not what he's talking about either. 
If you look at this in Genesis, and let me tell you this, if you look at this in the New International Version, you're not going to get it. A lot of the newer translations completely miss this because in, in Genesis, where it talks about Abraham and his seed, some of these newer translations, including the New International, don't use the word seed. They say descendants, Abraham and his descendants, and that's completely wrong. It needs to say seed. And the reason I say that is because of what Paul says in Galatians chapter chapter 3. He says, now to Abraham, this is chapter 3, verse 16 of Galatians. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not to his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So those translations that translate the word seed as descendants, because they think that's what he's talking about, they completely mess up the interpretation because they're, they think it's talking about descendants. But Paul makes it very clear in Galatians 3, he's not talking about descendants, he's talking about the seed, which is Christ. So the promises were not to Abraham and his descendants, the promises were made to Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. And if you be Christ, you are counted as Abraham's seed. Say, I'm Abraham's seed. This, this should be such good news to you because I, you know, if you understand the promises of what we thought, what many people think, it's all about the physical descendants of Israel. It's not. According to Paul, it's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And if you're in him, it's about you. You are a child of Abraham. You have the legal right under God to claim all the promises of Abraham, all the blessings. You're part of that covenant. So it's talking about you. You are the seed of Abraham. This, I think it should excite you. <laughs> you know, so... One reason, this, one reason I strongly dislike the NIV, there's many reasons I dislike the New International Version, but one reason is they mess up who this is talking about in Genesis. I think it's Genesis 15, somewhere around there, where it talks about Abraham and his seed, but the New International Version says descendants, and it's not what it's talking about. So, And many of the other modern translations, I, I guess I emphasize the New International Version because the school that I work at, they use the New International Version, and... I get frustrated with it <laughs> because it's, it's, it's wrong in so many places. But anyway, you know, I can't improve on what Paul's saying right here. I, this, so if you interpret Romans 4 in light of what he says in Galatians 3, it really should be eye-opening, I think. For the promise, let me read these verses again. For the promise that he, Abraham should be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham or to his seed according to the law or through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. Uh, there's a lot that can be said about that, but let me just say you're the heir of the world. As a descendant of Abraham, a spiritual descendant of Abraham, you are heir of the world. And here's why the devil doesn't want you to understand grace and faith. This is why the devil doesn't want you to understand the new covenant. Inheritance isn't generally given to only the good kids, right? I mean, all your children receive their inheritance, right? Good and bad. We know that from the story of the prodigal <laughs> and, and for, just from real life. You don't have to be good enough to earn your inheritance. So it's not based upon merit. What I'm saying is what you receive through God, what you receive through grace, what you receive through being an heir of God or an heir of, of, of Abraham is not based upon your behavior. It's based on your, on your identity. You're identifying with Jesus, identifying with who you are, spiritually speaking. It's based on genealogy. You are a son or daughter of God, and you are spiritually a, a, an heir of Abraham. Praise God. So, therefore, it's of faith. Verse 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed. Say, I'm the seed. I'm the seed. So this is for you. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So I am a child of Abraham. And so are you. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believeth, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth things which be not as though they were, who 
against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Okay, so again, he reemphasizes that we're all descendants of Abraham by faith. And go back to verse 17. The word quickeneth there, the word quickeneth means to, to breathe life. He breathes life. Abraham knew that even though he was nearly 100 years old, God was breathing life into him and that he was going to be able to do what God told him he would do. So, you know, don't accept, we, we think about how old Abraham was and the promise that was made. And Sarah around 90, she laughs when she hears the promise as, as an heir of Abraham by faith, you can do the same thing. Don't accept those symptoms. Call things which be not as though they are. That's what God does. And you're a child of God. You're considered a child of Abraham. You can call things which be not as though they are. So never again say, when you get symptoms in your body, don't just say, well, that's just part of getting old. No, speak to your body. <laughs> speak life into your body. He quickeneth the dead. He quickeneth. He speaks life into you. So as a mouthpiece for God, you can speak life into you. You can speak the life of God into your body. And when it comes to this church, never again say we're a small church, but say we're a growing church. Declare, call things which be not as though they were. Declare this place full in the name of Jesus. Let's call things which be not as though they are. Okay, so now in verse 18, it talks about against hope. In other words, all hope was against him. If you looked at his situation in the natural realm, Everything was against him. He was too old. His wife, 90 years old, was barren. And she was too old. So against hope, they believed in hope. No matter what the circumstances look like in your life, cling to God's promise. No matter how hopeless it may look, cling to God's promise. God is faithful. He's true. He's just. And he, he will... Um, he will do what he promised to do. So against all hope, just cling to, to, to uh, what he promised. Now, going on to verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not, in, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that that which what was what he had promised he was able to also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness what <laughs> do you guys get what he's saying here have you guys studied abraham's life from i think it's uh I and mean, this this was my initial reaction to this because if you study abraham's life i think it's 14 chapters from genesis 12 through 26 or something like that I see unbelief after unbelief after unbelief, don't you? I mean, he does act after act of unbelief and doubt, but yet it says here he staggered not. He considered not his own body now dead, though 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promises of God. He staggered a lot. <laughs> so why does it say this? Well, remember back in verse 17, it says God calls things which be not as though they were. So when you are in righteousness, when you're standing in righteousness, the gift of righteousness, God doesn't look at all your failures. He sees you literally as righteous. It's not just that God's pretending you didn't sin. It says he throws your sins into the sea of forgetfulness, right? As far away as the east is from the west. So when God looks at you, he sees you as righteous, as righteous as Jesus, because he's given you the very gift of righteousness. The gift of the righteousness of Jesus is imputed in, into you. So when God looks at you, he sees you as righteous. He doesn't see your failures anymore. He doesn't see your sins anymore. So this, I believe what we see in Genesis is a good record for our learning as far as the things that Abraham went through. But when we read it here in Romans 4, we're seeing what God sees. God sees Abraham as a man of faith. And ultimately, around 100 years old, he ultimately did stand in faith. And there's a lot that we can learn from this. It says, I want you to, to look at the, Th those three words, he considered not his own body. He considered not. If there's something 
attacking you from the enemy? This is how Abraham stood in faith. He considered not his own body. One person said, well, I know the Bible. One person told me recently, I know the Bible says that, but I'm talking about real life. You can't get any more real life than the Bible. But he said, well, I, I, know, I know the Bible. I know it says that, but I'm talking about real life. Well, what, what Abraham did is he considered not his own body. He considered it not. No matter what your body is telling you, if it's telling you something contrary to what God's word says, consider it not. Don't consider it. I mean, that's my approach to these things. When you're in a crisis and you consider your body or you consider your natural circumstances, you're opening the door to doubt and unbelief and you're hindering the manifestation. This is, I believe this is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter six, where he says, take no thought for what you will eat or what you, what you will wear. Right. And when Jesus said, take no thought, he's basically saying, consider not your natural circumstances. Don't consider that. Only consider the promise. Only consider what God has promised you. Jesus said, take no thought. So for this reason, I won't even listen to most radio commercials or watch most television commercials because they immediately want to tell you how sick you are. <laughs> they want to tell you about all your symptoms and how, what it could be this, or it could be that. And then they want to sell you a drug that has side effects that are worse than the initial symptoms. So don't even consider, you know, you, you, you get a pain in your body and you go online to figure out what this pain could be. And you, that's probably the worst thing you should do. <laughs> consider not what the devil is trying to throw at you. Okay, so let's go on to, there's a lot more I can say about that, but for the sake of time, let's go on to verse 23, because I want you to understand this is talking about you. This isn't just talking about Abraham. Paul's not bringing up this information about Abraham just to be talking about Abraham. He's trying to convey this is true about you also. Now, it was written, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. So it wasn't for Abraham alone. Here we see that this is true of us also. He sees you as a person of faith. He sees you as a righteous person. He declares you to be, what do you say to Gideon? You mighty man of valor. Do you guys know that story? Gideon was, was a coward. He was fearful. He was full of doubt and God approaches him and calls him a mighty man of valor. So <laughs> no matter what you're like in the natural sense, God sees you as a victor. God sees you as a mighty man or woman of valor. He sees you as righteous. He sees you as strong and healthy, successful, victorious. So you get the impression from many ministers that God is searching your heart, trying to find things in your life that are wrong, or he's trying to get you to correct all your mistakes. He's trying to get you to change. But I don't see that as the true gospel. God is not trying to find what's wrong with you. He sees you as perfect already. He sees you as righteous. And so it's important that you speak good things about yourself, speak God's word into your life and, and others. Speak good things about other people. Speak God's word into other people. Don't Pull people down with your words. Your words are powerful. Your words are like weapons of mass destruction. Your words can, can destroy or your words can build up. So speak in agreement with God's word. He sees you as perfect already. He declares you as victorious, as an overcomer already. So I'm not living for him nearly as much as he is living for me. And he's living for you. And he sees you as victorious and he wants to help you to overcome whatever it is that you're facing in life. And we're going to, if you're watching online and if you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Savior, I would like to encourage you to do that. In fact, why don't we all pray and repeat after me, God, please save me. I invite you into my life. I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. And he took, he took my place on the cross. He took all my sins and my failures and he imputes into me the very righteousness of God. 
Thank you for the gift of righteousness. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I claim that now in Jesus' name. And if you've prayed that prayer with a sincere heart for the first time, please let me know. We'd be happy to rejoice with you. We know the angels are rejoicing with you. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot. Nod your head, turn around, jump up and down, sit down. I, a lot of times I ask how many of you are called into the ministry, and maybe half the people or a few will raise their hand. But if you're, but if I ask if you're born again, pretty much every hand will go up. If you're born again, you're called into the ministry. Amen. All right. So, so my, uh, what I'd like, to, I'd like to actually, I'm not doing the sermon today, and that is, but I would like to share a scripture with you, and that's based on uh, Ephesians chapter four. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What this is saying is the, the leadership ministry, the teaching ministry is, is given by Jesus to the church for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Pretend that comma isn't there. The comma was not in the original Greek. The translators added the comma, thinking that that helps explain it, but it really doesn't for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. All right, so it's not that the pastors and the evangelists and the prophets are doing the ministry. They're doing the teaching and the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So if you're a born-again believer, if you're a Christian, you are called into the ministry. And, and, and in doing so, the edifying of the, of the body happens. The church is edified when everybody is doing their function in the ministry. When people just come, hear the message, and then go home, and then you don't see them again until the following Sunday, and they come and hear the message and go home, I think there's more to it than that. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, this is what I think. All of us, I think, want the church to grow. Whether you're a part of this church or not, you want your church to grow. <laughs> All right. And here is the solution I believe the Lord has provided in Scripture. This just, it, something about this jumped out at me this week, and I just wanted to share just for a few moments that, that the way to get the church to grow is for everybody to do their part. Right? I mean, this is what it's saying. For the perfecting of the saints, to, go back for just one second, for the perfecting of the saints to do the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. When the saints are doing their function in ministry, then the whole body is edified. Now go on to verse 16, I think it is. For, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. How many joints are here this morning? <laughs> Basically, I'm saying you're, that's referring to you. Every person, every person in the congregation supplies something to the edifying of the body of Christ, all right? So for whom the whole body, this is the whole body. Now, you might say, well, the whole body refers to the church universal. Well, that's true. But usually when the word church is used in Scripture, it's referring to a local congregation. So for, for our purposes, this is referring to us, all right? We are the body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which some joints supply. No, every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, not just the leadership, not just the pastors, but the effectual working in the measure of every part. That means you. You're all part of the every part. So every part, every person in the church has a part to play. The effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. All right, so the increase of the body, that means growth, church growth, the increase of the body happens when every part is doing their function. So you have a part to play. 
And what, what I, I don't know if you see it. This, it this, it's the way it jumped out at me this week. When every part is doing, when every Christian is doing their part, their function, their role, the church will grow. And if there's a lack of growth, I think maybe we could say some parts, well, there, there are some parts that, that don't, maybe they don't understand what their role is. Maybe they don't see what their role is, but every part has a role. Every person has a role. So I want to urge you to seek the Lord, find out what your role in the church is and do it. I can't tell you what your calling is unless God gives me a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom on that, but, but you have a role, you have a function, you have a ministry, do it, seek God as to what it is and do it. But one thing I say this with love, <laughs> punctuality, I think, is very important. One thing that I've always noticed, we, we have visitors from time to time. The one thing I've always noticed is visitors are always on time. And first impressions are important, right? But visitors are always on time and frequently early. I know that when I visit a church for the first time, I usually want to get there early and I want to get the full experience of what that church is about. The regulars need to be on time because first impressions are also important. So I want, I'd, I'd really like to encourage people to try to be at church on time and be in your role, be in your function, whatever your function is, and do it effectively. And I believe church growth will evolve from that. I hope you understand what I'm saying. If, you, if, you're, if you're not clear on what I'm saying, I would just encourage you to reread and meditate on this verse connected with verses 11 and 12, like I did a minute ago and meditate on this and realize that, that that seems to me at least part of what he's saying. The whole body fitly joined together when all of us are doing our part and compacted by that which every joint supplies, not just the pastor, but every joint supplies according to the effectual working of the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This just seems to me God's plan for church growth at least a principle. Maybe it's, there's a lot more to it than this. But I think this is part of God's plan for church growth. So it's a verse that I would encourage you to meditate on. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank and praise you for today. We thank and praise you for your word that will go forth. Father, just use me for your glory. Speak through me the words that you have to go forth and make the... Uh, listening, the ears of the listening, their hearts receive for us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are already here. And I want to talk about the kingdom of God and heaven. And just to give you a little background, <clears throat> Matthew is the only New Testament author to use the phrase kingdom of heaven. And its reference is reference 29 times in the Gospel of Matthew. While the other Gospel, Mark, Luke, and John, frequently reference the kingdom of God. So there you have the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And there is no uh, significant difference between the two of them. And Mark 19 23 to 24, Jesus said to his disciples, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, it is difficult for a rich man who clings to, pos to possessions and status as security to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven emphasizes itself. And the 24th verse, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man who places his, fa his faith in wealth and status to enter the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God emphasized the sovereign ruler of the king, of the kingdom, but they are the same kingdom. And they are used interchangeably in Matthew. In other words, if you think that your money or your status can get you into the kingdom of heaven, I got news for you. It will not. 
Salvation cannot be earned. It is a free gift for whosoever will receive Jesus as their Savior. And you know, before I received Jesus as my Savior, I went to church religiously. I was active in the different auxiliaries. I thought that all the good that I did would outweigh my bad. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> I thought that was my ticket for heaven. I just knew I was going to heaven until I got saved. <laughs> but sadly, that is the status of some people in church today. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking what one likes, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is entered into by accepting Jesus as our Savior, not by doing good works in the church or society or attending church on Sunday, Bible study on Wednesday, prayer service on Thursday, or by observing Christian holidays. We must be born of the Spirit in order to enter into God's kingdom. Let me share with you how I got my, the title for this uh, sermon today. I was in my car talking to Abba. You know how we do. And he said to me in my spirit, you are already here. You're already here. And I thought, I am? <laughs> and um, I thought about it. And this scripture came to me, <clears throat> Ephesians 2 and 6. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in, heaven, in the heavenly uh, place by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> so I began to read and study scriptures on the kingdom of God slash heaven and what it means to belong to Jesus Christ. You know, believers in Christ have privilege, privileges in the kingdom. Number one, we are his beloved children of God. And I know sometimes we may not feel like it, but we are. Colossians 3.12 says, So as God's own chosen people who are wholly set apart, sanctified for his purpose, well beloved, we not only beloved, we are well beloved by God himself. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience which has the power to endure whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good temper. Do you ever feel so loved and so special by Abba, Father, that you throw him a kiss? I do. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And it's not always been about the big things. It's been about the small things, the small thing that he does for me. And it is the small things that brighten my day. For instance, I've misplaced my eyeglasses, my purse, my credit cards, or forgot what item I went for when I went to go out of, when I went to go to the room. But he, by the Holy Spirit, brings to my remembrance where the item is and where it's located. For instance, last night I had my cord to my iPad and I unplugged it and I thought I put it in my room. And I said, no, it must be back in the living room. I went to the kitchen. <laughs> I said, well, maybe I did put it in the room. And I said, no. And I went back to my living room and I went over and there on the floor, it fell on the floor, it was there. So I said, thank you. Jesus, I praised him. I said, <laughs> I throw him kisses all the time. <laughs> and it makes me happy, and I laugh about it. 
I am his beloved child, and I am so secure in his love for me. And that's how we should be. We are so special to him, and he loves us so much. He values us, even when we, feel, we don't feel value, and we may not feel love. But, oh, he loves us so much. He's always with us. Praise the Lord. And Ephesians 5, 1 through 2 said, Therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example as well-beloved children. You know how they imitate their dad? So I've watched this young boy that I know who loves to imitate his father with his walk, his hand movements, the way his father stands. You know, the manly stand. He likes to imitate. I just look at him. I smile to myself because he is imitating his dad. And it's the same way um, with... Hi, this is Ken from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. I want to personally invite you to come to our church this Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. We're at 10 Pigeon Hill Drive, Suite 150, in the countryside area of Sterling. Every Sunday at Abiding Life, there's a great environment of joy and love, uplifting music, an encouraging message, and free coffee and snacks. Maybe you've been looking for a church, or maybe not, but either way, we really want to see you at Abiding Life this Sunday. So come and explore grace and faith and meet some great people in the process. I cannot wait to see you at Abiding Life this Sunday. Hi, I'm Pastor Ken Miller, and I'd like to invite you to Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. We are a growing spirit-filled congregation here in Sterling, Virginia, boldly proclaiming God's glorious gospel of grace, the finished work of the cross, and Christ's overwhelming love for you. More information is available at abidinglife.net. Come experience the power of God's word at Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church. Join us Sunday mornings at 11 in Sterling, Virginia. From just outside our nation's capital, from Abiding Life Grace and Faith Church in Northern Virginia, thank you for joining me for another edition of Rivers of Living Water. I'm Ken Miller. You can get information about this ministry at abidinglife.net or rolw.org. At our website, you can get information about the church, the media ministry, the outreach ministries, the missions outreach, the Bible college, and various coming events. Feel free to send me an email, pastor at abidinglife.net. Got to have your river, your river. I got to have, got to have, got to have.